The Juno World Affairs Council presents the gathering crisis of food security in Africa. It's nature, geography, and possible solutions with Roland Bunch. Bunch is an international agriculture development expert. He worked for Cornell University, the Ford Foundation, Oxfam, and numerous other NGOs and governments across the world. Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's great to see you all here. I'm, uh, as they said, I'm here for the first time. Actually, this is, uh, and I can tell you the story later if somebody wants, but uh, this is my second honeymoon. So <laughs> I, I'm not only enjoying the good weather, but a lot more. <laughs> <clears throat> the gathering food crisis uh, in, in uh, Africa. Now, this is not all over the entire continent, but in certain areas that I will explain in a minute. There we go. First, a little context. The, uh, Africa has changed an awful lot over the last two or three decades. It's had tremendous economic growth. And people have come to know, even the people in the most remote villages, have come to know much better what's happening in the rest of the world. Uh, their children, uh, have, most of them have migrated to the big cities. They've seen skyscrapers, they live in a modern city, they carry cell phones, and even people in the villages now, many, many of them have cell phones. Uh, this migration is huge in part because food production is lagging in many areas. And uh, uh, it's been so pervasive that the average age of smallholder farmers in Africa today is over 50 years. In other words, you go to village after village after village and you see almost nobody between, uh, at least no males, uh, between the ages of about 20 and 35. They know about and they want development. They know that, uh, as they didn't maybe 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, they know that they are not living as well as many people in the world and they want a better shake. <clears throat> so development is something they want. Um, they may have been frustrated several times because different projects have arrived in the village and haven't uh, changed much. But they de it's definitely something that they want and they look forward to. So there's no problem of trying to convince people to get involved in development. And of course, as you know, uh, this has been in the international news a lot, Africa has made great strides in terms of macroeconomics. Um, the average uh, growth of GNP over the last 20 years in a whole series of countries in Africa has been around 6%, which of course is a lot better than <laughs> in our country. Um, the problem though is that the progress has been extremely uh, limited in terms of who has uh, taken advantage of that increase in incomes. The inequality has gotten very, very bad, and by and large, the people in the villages are no better off than they were 20 years ago. Uh, so that is a problem. And of course, when there does exist that level of inequality, uh, you begin having, as has already happened in many African countries, uh, issues of political insecurity, mass violence, um, and all sorts of other uh, political problems. One other thing that's important in terms of the background of this whole discussion is that the family is still extremely important in African culture. Now this has a, uh, there's a good news side and, and a bad news side to this. The good news is that people still are very generous. They cooperate with each other. And especially when there are periods of drought or periods of, of poor production for whatever reason, they cooperate. Uh, very well. They, they, they share food with those who are not doing very well. And in general, the, the, the coping mechanisms that has helped Africans get through one problem after another for centuries are still pretty much intact, especially out in the villages. The, uh, and also this, um, this sharing and this equality and this working together is, is forms a basis for, for a surprisingly strong democratic tradition in certain areas of Africa. Now this is not universal. 
But for instance, in many parts of West Africa, the chiefs of, of, of the village are elected. Uh, you know, we, we didn't know that. In fact, we think democracy was sort of invented in Greece. Well, it's been around in Africa for a long, long, long time. And uh, uh, so you have um, a real basis for, for, for democracy, right, coming from the traditions in the villages. The bad news is that government officials still often have this idea that their responsibility is mostly toward the family, and if not the family, the kinship group or the ethnic group, what we used to call tribes. Um, and so uh, a, a strong favoritism in many, many countries in Africa for the uh, ethnic group of the political leaders of the country is, is a very, very serious problem. There are a few countries that have gotten away from that. Uh, Mali is, is one of them. Amazingly, uh, the, the different groups get along very well. But in countries from from Kenya to South Africa, the, the uh, problems uh, and the favoritism shown certain ethnic groups within the country is, is a very major political problem. Uh, this also t uh, leads to in, uh, inequality, uh, corruption, and uh, political polarization. Again, widespread development that affects the vast majority of the people is, is, is a tremendous necessity and, and could help overcome some of these, some of these uh, major uh, political and social problems. Okay, what I'm going to talk about today is a, in spite of the amazing progress that Africa's made over the last 20 years, there is a very, very serious problem that we're facing. And that is that in the lowland, drought-prone areas of Africa, the agricultural production is, uh, productivity is actually going down. And it's going down fairly rapidly at about 5% a year. And these are people who already are only producing enough food for about 9 to 10 months out of the year on average. And, and the rest uh, they're able to buy because their sons and daughters are working in the capital city or somebody is working in the mines or something like that. <coughs> But this is affecting basically the drought-prone lowland areas of Africa. Um, and uh, uh, I started looking at this uh, back in 2009, predicted that there were going to be serious problems in these areas. And here you can see, uh, mostly from statistics since then, that there is a huge red area on this map going across the uh, Sahel, which is just south of the Sahara. But you can see it. <coughs> Uh, cutting across here and then going down the east side. Actually, uh, three of these countries that are white should be red because the statistics, <clears throat> the UN is, is not too comfortable with the level of statistics. But in fact, the, the um, stunning rate is also uh, very low in those countries. And then cuts back across in the drought prone lowland areas of southern Africa, back across here. So you have this sort of sideways U shaped area that is basically, like I say, drought-prone um, lowland areas. And uh, the, these are the areas, for instance, in this case, on this map, where 40% of the children, 40% of these countries' children are stunted, which means they, have, they are so malnourished that, they are, that their both mental and physical potential will not be reached. Uh, which, which of course speaks very, very poorly for what's going to happen in the next generations. Um, this is a very serious problem. It's, it's been coming gradually. The main reason for it is that the population has grown to the point where people only have an average of about six or seven acres per family. Africa used to be the continent in the developing world that was, was quite land rich. Um, it's still you know, the, the, the smallholder farmers in Africa have more land than they do in Latin America and much more than they do in Asia, on average. But the land holdings are now small enough so people can no longer let the forest grow when their soil gets bad. And, you know, after 10 or 15 years, traditionally, they would let the forest grow, the leaves from the trees would fertilize the soil, and then they would cut down the forest and burn it or whatever and uh, they'd have fertile soil for four or five years. So they'd farm it for four or five years and then they'd let it fallow for 15 years. Well, when you only got six acres, you can't 
put four, let four of your acres be dedicated to growing trees over 15 years while you try and live on two acres. It just doesn't work. So following this, this process of fertilizing the soil through organic matter that falls from trees, or grasses in some cases, is now pretty much in its death throes. It's pretty much finished in most of Africa. Now this happened previously in, in Latin America and Asia, the same process, because they also used following. But what happened there was when the land got uh, too, um, the, the land holdings got too small to be able to follow, people just started using chemical fertilizer. The problem is chemical fertilizer now costs two to three times what it used to then, and Africa's soils are even worse, which means the, the response to the fertilizer is not as good. And so in most of Africa, for most smallholder farmers and for most subsistence crops, fertilizer is, is no longer a profitable uh, alternative. Now you can make some money if you're growing high value vegetables, if you're growing fruits. Uh, rice still has a very good international price because of the recent prosperity of Asia and so the, the price of rice is, has stayed quite high. But for maize uh, or corn, sorghum, millet, cassava, the different things that are the basic staples of Africa, chemical fertilizer is really not an option. And so you have yields going down and really no way <laughs> of dealing with that problem, at least that, that people in Africa know about. <clears throat> Africa could, with the technology we now know, uh, but is not widely known in Africa yet, Africa could become the breadbasket of the world. It has something close to about um, 25 or 30 percent of the world's <clears throat> unused land, arable land, uh, depending on how you, how you uh, classify arable land or how you define it. There are different ways and so people get different numbers here. <clears throat> Furthermore, the cost of increasing soil fertility using these new techniques that we have uh, been developing uh, is in fact very, very low. It's not expensive at all. This is not something that's going to take a whole lot of investment. It merely takes farmers learning how to do it and then going ahead and doing it. Africa also has other advantages. Uh, you know, when you, when you live in Nairobi, you expect days like these last few days to be about to three quarters of the time. <laughs> you know, and in many areas of Africa, the, our problem is it's too sunny. <laughs> uh, we also don't have to deal with snow being on the ground four months out of the year. Now that's a real problem agriculturally, but in, in the tropics, we, of course, we don't have that problem. And of course, also in Africa, there's a huge available supply of, of relatively inexpensive labor. So Africa could, could feed, I believe Africa, uh, using the techniques that I'll be talking about today, could feed all of Africa plus Europe and do a very good job of it. But a crisis that's on its way. 80% of smallholder farmers in Africa now have less than seven acres of land. Following is in its death throes, as I already said. As a result, the organic matter content of the soil is dropping, and with it, the natural fertility of the soil and farmers' productivity. In the lowland drought-prone areas of Africa, yields are going down by about 5% a year, and that's affecting 150 million people who live in the rural areas of these drought-prone lowland areas. Okay, what can be done? By far the uh, most important solution uh, that it can make a real difference in this on, on large scale uh, or at least as on the extensive crops that smallholder farmers have is what we call green manure cover crops. Now this is a, basically a, a <coughs> agronomist term for plants that fertilize the soil and control weeds. Okay? All we're talking about here, I'll, I'll use this term fairly frequently, but basically we're talking about plants that can fertilize the soil and also control weeds. They also, in most cases, will provide high protein food for the family at the same time and can do, uh, provide all sorts of other things like uh, uh, foliar sprays, uh, sometimes insecticides that people can make out of different parts of these plants. Sometimes they can um, collect firewood, which of course for African women, well, both, co both controlling weeds and um, uh, providing firewood 
are extremely important in terms of African women's uh, workload uh, because African women are the ones who are responsible for, for controlling weeds, at least on food crops, uh, and, and they're also uh, responsible usually for, for carrying the firewood. And uh, in many cases, they have to walk four and five kilometers, or say, say three miles, in order to get firewood. Uh, once they have these crops in their fields, they can walk uh, 200 meters and uh, never have to climb a tree and get all the firewood they need. And all this can be done without the use of expensive chemical fertilizers. Now, when people get up to uh, about three times the African average uh, in terms of productivity, uh, three times the maize that, that most smallholder farmers are now producing, then probably they will need uh, some chemical fertilizer. Um, we don't know because I don't work with farmers that are that well off at this point, <laughs> and, and nor do the other people who, who are, are working with these technologies. Um, but we do know that, that African farmers can get up to three times what they're presently producing without using a drop of chemical fertilizer in the vast majority of cases. So it doesn't have to be a real expensive uh, situation. In fact, if uh, they are able to use, and this depends on the particular crops they're using and, and the particular beans they like to eat and so forth. If they're using a green manure cover crop, one of these plants, most of them are leguminous, um, if they're using one of these plants that provides food that they like to eat, uh, the cost of growing those plants and fertilizing their soils with them will actually be a negative cost because they will make the value of the food they're producing is worth more than what it takes to, to produce, these, produce that food, which means that the fertilizing comes for free, okay? So it's not at all an expensive operation. Now, sometimes that doesn't work out. Sometimes it, it does cost something for them to fertilize their soils and improve them over the long haul. Um, but in most cases in Africa, um, they can, they can, the, the, the long-term fertilizer effect and the in improvement in their soils and the improvement of the organic matter content in their soils comes for free because they're being paid, all their labor is already being paid by the, by the high protein food that they're getting uh, to eat. And we can do this without chemical fertilizer. Um, it's interesting that if you listen to a lot of the discourse on agricultural development, um, you will hear quite frequently that, well, you can't really have agricultural development without chemical fertilizer. That's a funny argument because if you look back at the history of agriculture, chemical fertilizer was only used widely around the world after the Second World War and in the Third World not until about the 70s or 80s. What did people do before that? Did all our soils go bad, you know, in five or ten years and we'd have to abandon them so the whole world was full of wastelands? Not quite. People in the tropics kept their soils fertile, relatively fertile, for 3,000 years, 2,000 years, depending on how long they've been at it, sometimes 4,000 years. How did they do it? They did it by following. And basically what these green manure cover crops are doing is because people don't have enough land to follow anymore, to let the trees grow and, you know, the whole process, <clears throat> what we are doing is we've selected the best plants out of those forests and we're finding ways to put them right in people's fields. So people on the same land can continue to grow food and at the same time fertilize their fields. At the same time do the same thing as when they were following. Except they don't have to leave two-thirds of their land just for the following. They can do both of those processes on the same field. So we're not really doing anything that, that, that is all that new. I mean, it's taken 30 years for us to learn how to do this, and the Brazilians, by the way, have, have led this movement, really. Uh, they're, they're the people who have done more real, actual research on this whole thing than, than, than we ever did when I was, worked for 40 years in Central America. But the point is that <clears throat> um, this is not really a new process. It's a process that farmers used in the developing world for two or 3,000 years. And what we've done is just modify it a little bit so that it works better for farmers that don't have very much land. Okay, how can this be done? This photo is a, of a typical field in Honduras. A lot of our original research and original experience was in Central America, so a fair number of these photos will be from, 
Central America, but there will also be a few photos from Asia and, and a number of photos from Africa. This photo is a typical field in Honduras in which the forest was cut down and maize has been grown for four years. Uh, it's in pretty bad shape. There's a lot of erosion has been involved and of course the soil has become depleted. Uh, traditionally this field would have been abandoned and just left as wasteland. You know, cattle couldn't even graze on it. It just becomes wasteland and huge areas of Honduras presently are wastelands. But some of the farmers who uh, learned a better way of dealing with it. This is the same photo. Here they were doing some soil conservation work because 85% uh, of the land in Honduras is at a 15% slope or more, so you spend a lot of time doing soil conservation. And this is the same field, that same field, this same field, look at that soil. This is the same field six months later. Now the maize up on top of the little hill there is, is not looking very good, but the beans in fact are doing quite well. Another case, between 1973 and 1978, all done with organic matter. There's no chemical fertilizer, excuse me, in this particular picture actually we did back in the 70, early 70s we were still using some chemical fertilizer. But you can see that's the same hill, both pictures. Uh, you can see where the contour ditches were, were dug in order to uh, stop the erosion. And uh, they were, both pictures were taken the same time of year. Uh, you can see the difference in, in uh, you can see how white the soil is getting was getting in 73 and in 78 they were getting very, very good production. Here's a case in Honduras. The soil on the left, the farmer had left, abandoned it because it was wasteland. It wasn't, it, you can see how white it is. It wasn't producing hardly anything at all. Uh, a year later, uh, with a, a good shot of organic matter, the maize on the top was producing around, um, uh, let's see, it would be about 60, that's not a huge Obviously, not a, not a huge harvest here in the United States, but a very, very, about four times the national average in Honduras was producing about uh, 60 uh, bushels an acre. I have to convert from tons per hectare. And then the, in the, the southern section there where there's uh, several varieties of beans being tried out, just above one of the rock barriers there, uh, those beans actually produced more than the average bean harvest in the United States that year. So, you know, we can, we can get good yields by almost any standards. Here's another field in Honduras. The top half uh, had uh, a green manure cover crop called mucuna. You won't know the names of most of these plants. Um, mucuna, uh, it was intercropped with the maize three years, so the, the woman owner of this field was still getting uh, you know, her maize crop each year. But uh, you can see here up close, the, the woman owner is up at the top of the picture there, and you can see the tremendous difference between the maize at her feet and the maize behind her at least a, a, a four-fold increase in yields after just three years. Now that's a little better than we usually get. Uh, usually we can double yields in, in three to four years and by six years we, we hope to be getting at least three times the original yields in most situations in Africa and, and uh, Latin America. Of course it's much easier to triple yields when you have maize like this <laughs> in the lower half of the picture as any of you who are farmers will know. Uh, it's not so easy to triple maize yields when you have the kind of yields we have in the United States, but nevertheless. Okay, this is an interesting experiment that was done by a farmer. We always teach farmers to experiment. We never tell them, okay, just go do this. In fact, the whole process of, of development is very participatory. We, we spend a lot of time asking them questions, trying to you know, find out what they think and what their priorities are and how they do things and why they do them. Uh, but anyway, he thought that our talk, our talk about green, uh, you know, about, uh, we weren't talking about green manure cover crops at that time, but about organic matter, we were sort of exaggerating things. So he decided he was going to figure out if this was, this stuff we were saying was really true. So he planted his maize, well, before he planted his maize field, he made 16 compost heaps. And he piled all that compost in the, uh, on the left-hand side of his field there. He left two rows without any, the one where the arrows are and then another row there. You can see where the maize is kind of yellowish and about this high, okay? He left those two without any compost at all. We didn't even know about this experiment because like I say, he was, he was doing it because he didn't believe what we were saying. He was embarrassed to show it to us. But anyway, he finally did the day, the day I took this photo. The only difference between those two, between the maze where the arrows are and the maze on the left, 
is that he turned over the soil and filled it with organic matter. Okay? It's the only difference. Those fields had the same seed planted on the same day. Tremendous difference. I mean, you know. Huge difference. I mean, the field, the, the, it, it's hard. You can't say this is going to be five times that because the, the maze on the right isn't going to produce anything at all. Okay? Now, the first question that, well, the first question that came to my mind was, is, is this guy telling us the truth? <laughs> so I actually went around and asked quite a number of the farmers in the area, you know, is it really true? Conrather planted all that the same day? Because I had a hard time believing it myself. This was in 1983, by the way. The second question you ask yourself, because it's always a mistake to think that smallholder farmers in the developing world are dumb, why doesn't everybody in the third world have maize like this on the left? I mean, what's the problem? I mean, or there's organic matter all over the place. Why, why isn't everybody getting really beautiful maize like that? The interesting thing is that soil improvement in most of the developing world, now there are a few exceptions. There are a few exceptions where the soil's been uh, salinized, where it's got too much salt in it because they've been irrigating improperly or something like that. Or you know, there's some chemical problem caused by pollution or something, but in the vast majority of cases in the developing world, we have gradually realized that this is possible. You can go from maize like on the right here where the arrows are to maize on the left. It's not a chemical problem. It's not a problem of, you know, we got to have enough of this nutrient and that nutrient and we got to, you know, put on some, some uh, uh, lime or, you know, all that sort of thing. The problem is economic. How do we get enough organic matter on that field without spending too much money or too much labor? What Condrado did here, as dramatic as it is, was in fact, a, he suffered a loss because the increase in yield in that maize, even though it's gonna get a very good yield, is not gonna pay for all the labor he put into those 16 compost heaps, okay? Now, in a vegetable garden or something, you can make compost, and of course, there's easier ways to make compost than most farmers would have to make, you know, for a three-acre field. But compost for smallholder farmers is not, is not gonna pay for itself if you're using it on maize, sorghum, millet, cassava, and the other basic grains. It will pay for itself if you're growing vegetables, like I say, high-value vegetables or something like that, but it's not gonna work if you're, if you're trying to do it with with basic food crops, okay? You can grow a vegetable garden with compost, and I'm all for it. I mean, I, I love compost. We, we've taught a lot of people to make compost through the years, but it's not gonna cut it on a large field of maize, okay? So the real problem is economic. How can we get enough organic matter? And in fact, we've now learned through experience in country after country using these green manure cover crops that it takes about 20 to 25 tons. Now, this is, this is not dry weight, this is green weight. But it takes about, because farmers can't be, you know, drying everything in ovens and all that sort of stuff. So it takes about 20 to 25 tons per hectare of organic matter to maintain soil fertility. And more than that, if you want to improve soil fertility over the long haul. Okay? Now, I have never in my life seen a smallholder farmer that produced over two tons of compost in a given year. It's just way too much labor. I mean, you'd spend months, okay? But if you grow uh, one of these green manure cover crops that I'll show you in a minute, almost all the ones I mentioned here will produce um, about 40 to 50 tons per hectare. Now that sounds like an awful, 40 to 50 tons? But if you think about it a minute, uh, now a hectare is about three times an acre and the conversion is gonna cause a little bit of a problem here. But three, 30 tons per hectare is only three kilos per square meter. Metric system is wonderful, you know. <laughs> that's only three kilos, that's about six pounds in a square meter, which is a little over a square yard. Now lots of plants can produce that. I mean, you know from your own gardening that, uh, you know, producing six pounds of, of organic matter, green weight, uh, in a square meter is not a, not a big problem. So by using these green manure cover crops, we tremendously reduce the costs of permanently and over the long haul improving soil fertility. 
Okay, one alternative is chemical fertilizer. You've got not only the cost of the chemical fertilizer, you've got the cost of the transport. This particular farmer in Haiti has to take that fertilizer a whole day on that mule in order to uh, fertilize his fields. It becomes extremely expensive. There's no way, I mean, in this particular case, that there was a local program there, a uh, non-governmental organization that was subsidizing the chemical fertilizer, so it was, it was worth his time to do it, but not at uh, com regular commercial prices. We already talked about the problems of compost. We've done all sorts of things. For instance, in this case, we didn't cut the corn stalks. We just put them in hole to see if we could still rot them and, and that would reduce the cost. But even if you do absolutely everything possible to reduce the cost of compost, in, in the vast majority of cases, it's gonna be too expensive. Now there is, you can, like they do in, in Nepal where I live now, you can take the organic matter from your field and put it under your animals. If you have enough animals, then they will, they will uh, uh, they will fertilize the, uh, the plant material and you can take it out to the field. That becomes a lot less expensive. Sometimes that can be profitable. But by and large, composting is out of the question. Animal manure, absolutely great. If you have it, use it. It's wonderful. As, as all of you who have gardened know, manure can be wonderful for your crops. The only problem is that if you, by definition, if you're a poor farmer, you don't have enough animals to fertilize two hectares of, of land. I mean, that would take about uh, uh, 15 to 18 well-fed cattle. If you've got that many cattle, <laughs> you, you don't have to worry about producing food crops very much. You're, you're, you're well off in the developing world. Okay, there's other alternatives, coffee pulp, uh, sugarcane bagasse, and, you know, in certain areas where people grow these crops, they can use that as um, fertilizer. But by far the easiest solution and the most widely applicable solution is green manure cover crops. Now you won't know, I don't think, probably none of you have ever seen any of these seeds. These are uh, tropical seeds. Uh, they produce tremendous amounts of biomass and they can, um, every one of those can be intercropped with maize. Uh, some of them can be intercropped with sorghum and millet or cassava. And, uh, or they, uh, some of them, like the one in the middle, the white one, is extremely drought resistant, so you can grow that through the dry season and fertilize your soil that way. Okay, we're not talking here about, uh, are any of you agronomists? Okay, we can forget this. There, there's some problems we have to overcome with agronomists, but uh, thank goodness we don't have to here. Okay, what are we looking for in terms of green manure cover crops. First of all, vigorous growth. We want absolutely as much growth as we can get so that we have more fertilizer for our fields. Uh, we want good weed control, partly for the sake of, in Africa, the sake of women, but partly in just anywhere in the world for the sake of, of reducing costs. Uh, you can see under this, uh, this particular green manure cover crop, you can see on the ground there, I think, there's, I, I think there's one grass weed right in the sort of center left of the picture. Outside of that, I don't think you'll find any weeds in that whole field, okay? This means that later, that means that weed seeds are not being produced, which means later on when you put in your crop, there's gonna be a lot fewer weeds, and furthermore, you're gonna plant this again, and it's gonna grow up and cover your, your weeds, so, so you know, the, the amount of labor involved is drastically reduced. Uh, sometimes it's the mulch, not the, not the growing, in this case, it's the growing green, uh, green manure cover crop. In this case, it's the mulch that was left over from the last time they produced maize. This maize is old enough so that that farmer, under normal conditions, would have to be doing a second weeding. Or probably it's a little late to do the second weeding. He should have done it a, a few weeks ago. In this case, he's never had to weed that. The mulch took care of it. And the mulch came from last year's green manure cover crop. So, you know, uh, a, a maize crop with zero weeding. Nice, ni nice if you can do it, huh? <laughs> Okay, so other times uh, we can grow the green manure cover crops uh, among fruit trees, in this case citrus trees in Paraguay. Uh, and that, that's a, uh, a lupin. I'll tell you about lupins in just a minute. We'll see another picture of them. But uh, uh, lupins are, are, are particularly interesting, some of them. Um, we want plants that will grow in very poor soils. The, the field on the left and the right are just the same field 45 days later. You can see that the green manure is growing very well even though that soil is practically chalk. We also want healthy nitrogen fixation. The nitrogen is, is the 
most limiting factor in most of the developing world and certainly in Africa. Um, what I've got in my hands there are nodules. Now I know that on all the textbooks you ever saw there was one little nodule about this big around maybe every inch or two inches along the root. Well that's basically fertilizer company propaganda. They don't want you to know what these plants can do. Uh, those are nodules from one uh, velvet bean plant. Uh, you don't know what velvet bean is, but, but anyway, it's one of these plants that we use. Those are the nodules from one single plant. Now this won't happen very often. We, we, we set up a special case where this plant didn't have any competition from any other plants. We wanted to just see how much it could produce. We were totally shocked. But I actually watched them dig up the plant, so I know that these are all from one, one single plant. The, you know, this, this particular plant can fix, now this is much, much greater than what we get with, oh, okay. Um, this is uh, much greater than what you've probably heard of before, but this one will fix 150 kilos per hectare. I mean, you'd have to translate that into, but that's the equivalent of about uh, uh, six, no, it would be about 12 bags of urea per hectare. So it would be, what, four bags per, ha per acre or something like that of urea? Nobody ever applies that kind of chemical fertilizer on a piece of land. Okay, this in a, is a case in Central America where people are making tortillas with one-third, uh, in this case, velvet bean and, and two-thirds maize. The protein content of the tortilla has just doubled. Okay. How can we grow green manure cover crops without taking up land that people need to grow their food on? Well, there are about five ways that we use quite widely. There are a few others in particular situations, but first of all, by intercropping. We can intercrop in the tropics because we have a lot more light. The light comes, direct, comes down directly from the sun, so one plant doesn't shade the next plant, and so we can do a lot of intercropping and get uh, at least a 70 to 80 percent increase in total biomass production out of a field. So uh, intercropping is a, is a major way we do it, sometimes growing it under trees. Uh, here's an interesting case where uh, this particular green manure will uh, stay there for over 30 years. You never have to weed your field. Uh, that's vanilla production in southern Mexico. The, the trees you see there are the tutors, uh, live, live tutors. But uh, that field won't have to be weeded for 30 years. Nice situation. Uh, you can grow them during the dry season. This is from Thailand where people grow two different beans that they eat. They get high proteins from it, uh, high protein content, and the, uh, they're, they're growing them during the dry season when they didn't use their land previously because these particular beans are very drought resistant. This is interesting. These are the lupins again. This is up in the Andes, way high, about three or 4,000 meters up in the Andes, even higher than your highest peaks here. And um, this plant is able to fix 400 kilos of nitrogen per hectare. That's uh, six or eight times what you need. In fact, the biggest problem with this is if you grow it too densely among your maize, you're going to get too much nitrogen and you won't get any crop. All you get is a lot of leaves. So, but, but uh, you know, the idea that we can't get enough nitrogen, we can't get enough uh, nutrients for crops by using uh, plants is, is just not the case. Uh, this is a case from Cameroon in Africa where, where they're using it as an improved fallow. Uh, th these people still fallow, used to fallow for four years. Now they grow this legume in there. They just broadcast the seed when the rains come the next year. And uh, in one year, they've fixed up their land so well that they can, they can farm it for three more years. So instead of only farming the land about one out of every two years, actually four out of eight years, instead of farming the land four out of eight years, they can farm it three out of three, well, six out of eight years. So they basically are increasing the, the amount of land they can farm each year by, by 50% just by doing this. Everybody gets half again as much land as they had before, basically. Okay, these are some of the crops. Here you can see tremendous uh, weed suppression. There are virtually no weeds. Those false banana trees are about the only weeds in that field. Okay, in fact, that's about five fields. Uh, this is a system that's used by about 20,000 farmers all the way from northern Honduras up to almost Texas in Mexico. It's uh, being used in four different countries by around 20,000 farmers. Uh, by the way, in Brazil, there are over 2 million farmers doing this on 20 million hectares. So, uh, you know, I mean, this is not something that's just getting started. It's just getting started in Africa, but not in, not in South America. Okay, this is another one. Uh, very, very drought resistant here. Most of the maize died. Uh, it can be intercropped, in, like in this case, with cassava. 
and that means the women only have to weed the field once instead of three or four times. Uh, this is another interesting one. Uh, it can be eaten like peas or dry beans and you can even eat the leaves off the plant if you want to. Extremely drought resistant. Um, this is called runner bean in New York State. It's called um, Seneca bean and this is one I would guess you could use here in, in uh, uh, southeastern Alaska, I would, I would guess. Phaseolus coccinius. Uh, here's another one you probably have heard of, uh, fava bean. Uh, we also use trees a lot of the times. So in conclusion, green manure cover crops can fertilize the soil, recuperate wastelands, end shifting agriculture, control weeds, protect farmers from climate change, and provide food, fodder, fuel, and or other products. Furthermore, they can all do, do all this at very low cost. Nevertheless, they must be grown on land that has no opportunity, well, land that isn't used to farm other things. We can't ask people to grow less maize in order to grow fertilizer. Uh, improving the soil takes several years. You don't, you don't uh, just all of a sudden in one year have a doubling of yields. And factors like grazing animals, bushfires, termites, and difficult growing conditions can present serious problems. Uh, there are problems that we have to overcome. That's part of what my job is. Uh, thus, green manure cover crops can require of us a good deal of knowledge and creativity to find the systems that will provide the most benefits for any given group of farmers. And that's what I'm doing in about 15 countries right now in Africa. Okay. <clears throat> Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. If people would, would like, like to ask questions, there's a microphone there and ask you to go and stand at the microphone to ask your question. Uh, so line up. I'm sure that there'll be questions about why, why isn't everyone doing this? I'm interested in knowing how concretely you get invited into a particular place and go about building a level of trust or confidence to to get a farmer or a group of farmers to change a practice. Yeah. Okay, first of all, it's not, it, it's much harder getting the organizations involved than the farmers. The farmers, when they hear that this is basically the same process their grandfathers used to keep their soil fertile, and the farmers are aware that soil fertility has gone down in the last 20 years like it couldn't have gone down for the 2,000 years before that. So the farmers are not usually too difficult to convince. And of course, the, another thing is we only ask farmers to try it out. We never ask them to do it on a large scale. So they try it out, they make the decision as to whether they're gonna do it on a large scale. And, and the risks of trying it out on a small piece of land are just not that high. So farmers are not the problem. Now, uh, how we get large organizations, uh, basically I work right now through three organizations. I'd like to find another one, but we'll see. I work with, through three organizations, two of them you, you would know about. One is CARE, and the other one is Catholic Relief Services. Uh, these are donor-based organizations, as, as some of you may know, um, both based in the United States. And each, with each of them, I work in about four or five countries. So I work with certain organizations that, that are large enough so I can work in four or five countries with a given organization. I will give a few courses. I will visit some of the farmers and uh, you know, ask a lot of questions, find out what's going to work best in their particular situation, train their people in how to do it, and then they will be working with the farmers to get them to try these out, and, and eventually the farmers will hopefully adopt them. My goal over, the, over six years is to have at least one very successful, widely applicable green manure cover crop system in each of 15 countries uh, that, that uh, you know, will, will spread on its own. Uh, so that when the crisis really gets bad and everybody realizes what's happening, there will be local solutions that people can, can find in the countries, the particular country they're working in. Um, how I find them, basically uh, they have to find me. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I, I am known because of the book I wrote back in the 1980s, and uh, people hear about what's happening. They hear it from other people in their organization. They hear it from other people. Some once in a while, I, I uh, give a speech at, in an international conference or something like that, and then basically we develop a relationship and work together. Um, some time ago on NPR, I heard this program about Terra Preta, which is in along the Amazon, and that they use charcoal, and the charcoal, when it was added to the soil, made it 
uh, so that the nutrients in the soil would stay longer. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just wondering, is, is that something that you also do in, this, in, in some of these places yeah. you go? Uh, terra preta is a very, very interesting thing. We need to learn more about it. Uh, uh, it hasn't been accepted widely, but I think it, I think it has a real future. Uh, we aren't working with it because right now we have, we know how to use green manure cover crops. We've been working with them for about 30 years now in, in Central America and especially in Brazil. And um, it's ready to go. And, and furthermore, uh, there's a whole series of advantages like I talked about, producing food, high protein food for the families, producing firewood, doing all these sorts of things that Terra Preta can't do. So, you know, I, 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 I absolutely am, am thrilled that they've discovered Terra Preta, which wasn't, what, I don't know, 10 years ago or something, and that uh, research is being done on it, and eventually farmers will be able to use it. Um, it's just, it's, it's, it's not ready to go right now on the scale that I'm working. Thank you. You've, you've definitely sold me on green manure cover crops. <laughs> But there is a, there, there, there's, there's kind of an elephant in the room that you haven't discussed at all, and that's uh, the effects of climate change, like in Africa, the, the Sahara is moving south. And this is going to obviously have an impact on farming and probably which, which green manure cover crops can be used. You're going to, what's, what's good now may not be good in 10 years, that sort of thing. I wonder if you could comment on that. Yes, that's definitely a, a part of the situation. <clears throat> um, we, well, first of all, the tremendous scare that exists in the development community because of the fact that in the Sahel, uh, 20 years ago, there was only one drought every 10 years, and now there's a drought about every third year, is partly because of climate change, but a huge part of that is because as farmers have no longer been able to follow, the organic matter content of their soil goes down, and so instead of say 50 or 60 percent of the rainwater going into the soil, 10 percent does, and the rest runs off because uh, the soil is too hard. Uh, you know, all of you that have worked in gardens know if you don't have any organic matter in your soil, it turns into, a, a, you know, a very, very almost impenetrable, uh, um, well, the soil becomes impenetrable, and so you, you, you um, the rate of infiltration can drop by 60% or 70% if you don't have any organic matter in your soil. So, and, and in fact, more and more in Africa, we're seeing in the same year, in the same area, you will have droughts and uh, floods. Well, that's because all the water's running off of certain places and it's all winding up in some place downstream and, and uh, they're having floods. Um, so what we are doing more and more is, uh, you see these trees here? <coughs> uh, you can grow those trees across a field because in the tropics we have so much sunlight. If you have a 20% shade or a 30% shade, your crops will actually grow better. Maize, for instance, shuts down. In the lowland tropics, maize will shut down for like about two hours or three hours each day because it gets too hot. And so if you have these trees with a 20 or 30% shade, the maize will produce uh, we're not sure exactly how much, but at least 20% more than it does otherwise. And in addition to that, uh, you're getting the leaf drop. This, this tree is a wonderful green manure cover crop. Uh, you're getting leaf drop, and the tree has three or four other uses I won't get into. So by having, this is what we call dispersed shade or dispersed trees. Uh, by having systems like that, uh, we can basically uh, dramatically reduce people's um, problems with, with um, global warming. The, um, uh, what will happen is, as things get hotter, you just cut fewer branches off your tree and your crops are going to be the same temperature as they were before. You know, you have a little bit more shade, you know, every five years or something you cut a little bit less off so your crops have a little more shade, which means that even though in general it's hotter, the, the, the ambient temperature where your crops are is going to be the same as it was before. So basically, we're, we're, we're building up a tremendous amount of resilience to climate change. The other thing that climate change has been doing for a number of years, well, for decades now, in the developing world is uh, making the rains much less predictable than they used to be. And of course, a farmer has a harder time uh, with unpredictable rains than, than he or she does with, say, a 10% drop in rains total, uh, because, because you just don't know when to plant and so forth. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, 
almost all farmers in the developing world planted according to the calendar. By the 80s, they couldn't do that. And if you go out and ask them now, farmers almost anywhere in the developing world will tell you, yeah, back in about the 70s or 80s, things started getting fouled up. We don't know why, but the, the rains just, you know, they'd come a month late or they'd come two weeks early or they'd come two months late. And we just, now we just never know when they're going to fall. So uh, that is also improved by the fact that these trees drop a lot of organic matter. The, the soil has much more organic matter. In shade, you have a reduction in both your evaporation and transpiration rates, but, which just means the soil gets dried out more slowly, as it always does in a forest, as opposed to a, a sunny piece of field. And so we're even going to get resilience uh, to uh, short-term droughts during the growing season. Thank you. You're welcome. Can you talk a little bit about no-plow agriculture? Absolutely. In fact, I'm a, I'm a great fan of it. Uh, actually, there's a huge movement started in Brazil with the, the same people that uh, started doing this green manure cover crop work about the same time we did in Central America. And uh, they would never think of doing green manures without zero tillage, or, or at least minimum tillage. And uh, uh, we, we feel the same thing now. They convinced us. <laughs> And in Africa, there's, the, the same movement is, 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 is gathering tremendous, uh, 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 tre a tremendous number of, of people dedicated to it. It's called conservation agriculture. Uh, you, could, you could look at it, you could Google it or something, but conservation agriculture is, uh, in Africa, it's defined a little bit differently, and that's why there's a need for my work, because they don't include green manure cover crops in it. What they include is, Minimum or zero tillage, which is what you're, you're mentioning. Uh, keeping the soil covered, which is, of course, much easier if you are doing minimum tillage because you aren't plowing everything under. And uh, the third thing is, is uh, uh, using a, um, uh, more biodiversity, you know, rotating crops, having green manures, so forth and so on. And this movement is spreading across Africa fairly well. Um, I think it'll, 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 what I'm working on entirely with organizations that are already doing conservation agriculture and adding green manures to it because the problems that you have with zero tillage, like more weeds, can be controlled by the green manure cover crops. Uh, so that, so that the three, the, the, the conservation agriculture movement as it is in Africa as opposed to Latin America, uh, together with green manure cover crops, I think is going to be, that's the way to go. It's interesting if you look at these different rules, you know, don't plow the soil, uh, keep the soil covered, uh, have lots of biodiversity, uh, you know, use, include legumes in your, in your process. If you think about it a minute, that's exactly what a tropical forest does. And there's a fourth rule, which is the weirdest of all, and that is feed your plants through the mulch, or what in forestry they call litter layer, litter layer. Tropical trees in a tropical forest don't get their nutrients from the soil. They get them from the litter layer. And they have to for, for several reasons. The main one is that if the phosphorus gets into the soil, 99.4% of it will be unavailable to your plants within a matter of hours. Okay? So you have to catch that, those nutrients before they hit the soil if you're going to have a sustainable system. But anyway, it's, it's, it's very interesting that, <laughs> like in Central America, it took us about 12 years to discover these different rules and start working with them and so forth. And all of a sudden, one day in a meeting, we realized, my gosh, all we're doing is copying the tropical forest. You know, why didn't we just think of that in the beginning and realize that in a tropical environment, we ought to see what the forest does and, and copy it? Because after all, forests are totally sustainable. They've been there for millions of years. You know, nobody has to plow them, no, you know, and, and, and did you ever see a yellow forest because it was nitrogen deficient? <laughs> Not unless you've been in a bamboo forest in China or something. Um, tropical forests are totally sustainable. We can do the same thing. I've heard you talk about um, organizations like CARE, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure they do great work, but I haven't heard you talk about the role of uh, African governments in promoting this work. Okay. Now that's sort of a sad story. During the uh, structural adjustment programs that the World Bank forced on all African debtor countries, which was most of them, uh, they basically uh, wiped out the agricultural extension services and, and a lot of the uh, support of education and so forth of national governments. And this happened all over the developing world. I mean, it also happened in Latin America. 
the uh, most extension services in Latin America in about the late 80s or early 90s during these saps were, uh, were pretty well destroyed, pretty well gutted. So governments are not doing much. They're beginning to do a little bit more. Um, we're hoping that, that with the example that these large-scale NGOs like Catholic Relief and Oxfam and so forth uh, and CARE and, and the Food Grains Bank from, from uh, Canada, we're hoping that with the example they're, they're providing that governments will really become interested in this and, and it's beginning to look like that. Both Zambia, the governments in Zambia and Mali have both uh, started looking at what we're doing and, and are getting very interested in it. So, so we hope to pull them along, and, and uh, you know, but, but they aren't going to be real major players, I don't think, because they just don't, they, they, they don't have the budgets for it. Is there a last question? Go ahead. <coughs> you mentioned at the beginning that there's a potential to uh, grow enough food for Africa and Europe as a, a type of a scale. Uh, my, my concern is that there also is demand for crops that happen to include grains and things like that, and, uh, and then a lot of row crops, uh, sugar beets. Uh, how does this land get converted, and how, what, what is the cycle time for green crops and they say more commercial crops? crops that would be in demand. Uh, so how do these integrate? Yeah, uh, that's, that's a complex question and I can't say I really have a good answer for it. It will depend in Africa, in the case of Africa, it will depend to a, on a large extent on the level of infrastructure that, that uh, is, is built over the next 10 or 15 years. And some African countries are, are spending a lot of money right now in infrastructure. But, you know, if we're talking about uh, uh, things are going to be produced for use in Europe or, or the United States or elsewhere, uh, biofuels and, and the things you mentioned, uh, the infrastructure is going to have to be a lot better. Um, we have a little motto that the, the first market is the stomach. And so we're going to be happy if we can just have people having, producing enough food to last them a whole year uh, for, you know, for their own consumption. Um, but gradually, yes, this, that has to be part of the picture and, and it could be that Africa never will get to the point where it's feeding more than one continent because it's growing uh, more and more cash crops and more and more biofuels and more and more, uh, you know, other, other, other crops like this that, that uh, are basically cash crops. That was agriculture expert Roland Bunch in this Juno World Affairs Council presentation, produced in collaboration with 360 North. It was recorded August 26, 2015 at 360 in Juneau with support from GCI, Alaska Electric Light and Power Company, Wastman and Associates Incorporated, Core Alaska Incorporated, Hecla Greens Creek Mining Company, Sea Alaska, and Alaska Power and Telephone.